What happened? The third starship launched. How did it go? Does anything require repairs? And why did it tumble? Dream Chaser is gearing up for the launch, ABL Space is back in action, and Strato Launch tests their hypersonic vehicle. My name is Felix, welcome to What About It, let's dive right in. Starship updates. This really happened. Humanity is now capable of sending a 120 ton starship to space. It was crazy and the best thing is that this is just the beginning. SpaceX is already preparing the launch site for flight number 4. Wanna know more about what happened during flight number 3? Come with me. It's only been a few days since Starship's third launch and there's already a wealth of new information about the flight and its outcome. Most notably, SpaceX has issued an official statement on the mission, which we'll dive into shortly. But first, let's look back at the launch itself. A friend of mine, Flo from Germany, put together an epic video that syncs up all three Starship flights, which allows us to make some interesting observations. For instance, it's striking to see how similar the second and third flights were in terms of the propellant levels throughout the flight. This is very different from the first flight, which had numerous problems, including a leak that can be seen when looking at the levels of oxygen and methane. We really have come a long way since that launch, haven't we? The video aligns with what SpaceX revealed in the flight plan. The most engines cutoff phase started a bit later in flight 3. That's the point at which the booster prepares for stage separation. Similarly, the boost back burn began later, though it occurred at an altitude nearly identical to the previous flight. Interestingly, Booster 10 was at a velocity of 100 km per hour or 62 miles faster than Booster 9 during the boost back. Perhaps this is the tiny adjustment that was required to master the boost back. I highly recommend visiting Flo's X profile to watch the synced trio of flights. It's a great way to appreciate the progression and adjustments made across these missions and an eye-opener as to what this is all about. Progress. While we're at it, let's revisit the booster landing, which didn't quite go according to plan. In the last episode, we speculated that Super Heavy might have met its end upon water impact in the Gulf of Mexico. While the footage seemed to support that theory, SpaceX's recent statement shocked us. The booster actually exploded above the water at an altitude of 462 meters or 1500 feet. Wait, what? ULA snipers? The statement didn't specify whether the flight termination system was activated, suggesting the cause might be more complex than initially thought. If it wasn't the FTS, then the explosion might have originated from the engines. The plan was for 13 Raptors to execute the landing burn and get rid of the descent velocity, yet only three engines managed to ignite, and saying ignite is quite generous in this case. Unfortunately, the released statement doesn't mention why so many engines failed to relight. There may have been some complications during re-entry. Although the booster didn't reach extreme velocities like the upper stage, it still experienced atmospheric re-entry. SpaceX's animations even showed plasma enveloping the booster during this phase. While real-time footage didn't show any plasma, the engines were undoubtedly exposed to intense heat. Rocket engines, despite their power and the immense thrust they generate, are surprisingly delicate. A Raptor engine requires precise coordination of all its components to function correctly. Even a tiny bit of damage can disable the engine or escalate into a significant mission hazard. We will likely remain in the dark about the precise cause of the failure until the mishap investigation is wrapped up. Despite this minor inconvenience, SpaceX reported that Booster 10 executed its mission flawlessly up to that point. I think we reached a milestone in Super Heavy's development where we can say that ascent is no longer an issue. The booster achieved everything expected of a traditional rocket booster and more. As a fun fact, all the traditional media outlets talking about exploding and lost starships and boosters should keep in mind that on any other orbital rocket launch except for Falcon 9, this is a completely normal thing. The rocket is lost every time. Regarding the ship, despite no visual confirmation during the livestream that the payload bay door had closed, SpaceX later confirmed that the pass dispenser worked as intended. More crucially, they confirmed our suspicions about the role observed during the flight, it was unintended. Perhaps SpaceX wanted to do a single spin to test attitude controls, but something prevented them from cancelling this spin. One possibility is that a vent might have frozen over, preventing it from being used. Roll and vent issues could also explain why Starship struggled with re-entry. 
Despite losing a few heat tiles during liftoff, this minor damage likely wasn't the catalyst for the ship's demise. Some skilled artists have taken the telemetry data shared during the stream and transformed it into a 3D animation. From these visualizations, it is clear that Starship re-entering the atmosphere on its side was a much more in-depth issue. Instead, the vehicle might have been tumbling, at times entering the plasma stream with its engines first and occasionally even upside down. No spacecraft, even with its tiles perfectly in place, could withstand such conditions. Considering that this indeed was the ship's orientation, its ability to transmit telemetry and video data under those circumstances is all the more remarkable. RCS thrusters, or at least some serious improvement to the current attitude control system on the Starship upper stage will be needed. This is something to look forward to for IFT4, steady progress. This moment is also a perfect opportunity to acknowledge the immense effort and dedication of the thousands of engineers working tirelessly to make this ambitious project and progress a reality. While we're here to observe and document their achievements, they are the true heroes pouring all their knowledge and experience into this. If you appreciate their work as much as we do, please leave a supportive comment. We no, many folks at SpaceX tune into our videos regularly. You all rock! Following the launch, our on-site photographer John set out to assess the aftermath of the third launch. Thankfully, the launch complex and its surroundings appear to be in relatively good shape. The most noticeable signs of wear were on the chopsticks used to lift and in the future catch the Starship. While they emerged largely undamaged from the previous IFT2 flight, this time around we saw a sizable conduit dangling from them. Oops. Upon closer inspection, it is clear that some cables have been damaged and will need replacing. Not a biggie, but definitely worth mentioning to get a full picture. The chopstick mechanism seems to have survived the launch without significant harm as it was quickly and safely lowered after the launch. The ship's quick disconnect panel, which supplies power and fuel to the upper stage right up to liftoff, also appeared to be in much better condition this time around, with no major damage observable at first glance. Maybe this rapid reusability thing will really be possible one day. Moving down to the orbital launch table, as expected, it experienced a lot of heat from the 33 Raptor engines blaze, but nothing out of the ordinary. Most importantly, the doors are still there, it looks massively better than the IFT-1 hole digging competition, and arguably even better than IFT-2. Steady progress. At the base of the tower, there is some evidence of the Raptor blast, but nothing critical. This is precisely the reason for those metal plates. They were designed to withstand the launch, and considering how much doubt there was before their first use, I'd say this is a solid high five to the SpaceX engineers. Beyond the tower, the area has scattered debris likely ejected from the launch site. The new smaller water tank has shed some of its insulation, and the work platform in front of the new Stage Zero tanks was a bit mangled. Okay, but what about the tank farm? Countless dents to repair? Basically none. During the first two launches, the GSE shells took quite a beating. This prompted SpaceX to reinforce two of them. The leftmost tank shows a minor dent, but overall they held up remarkably well. Interestingly, the two tanks without shields seem to have escaped damage entirely. My theory here is that the right tanks are in the shadow of one of the launch mount legs. That would explain the different exposure to the blast. It would be very interesting to see a flow animation of the exhaust gases as they flow through the launch site. I'll ask Ryan Hansen. Maybe he can help. Those two outer tanks seem to be largely out of harm's way. Surprisingly, SpaceX chose to install glass windows in the new restroom facility behind the tower before the launch, a decision that raised some eyebrows. Yet post-launch the windows are still there, perfectly intact. Overall, the launch infrastructure doesn't seem to require that much refurbishment this time. One thing is for sure, SpaceX is eager to complete this process as fast as possible. You'll be surprised to see how quickly they began their work after the launch. But before we talk about what's waiting for us next, let's hear a word from our sponsor. It is kind of about refurbishment as well. As a news host, my appearance matters, but so does my well-being. That is why I love Nutrafol. It embraces a drug-free, whole-body approach, promoting hair growth from within. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist-recommended hair growth supplement brand with over 1 million people seeing thicker, stronger, faster-growing hair with less shedding. 
Since incorporating Nutrafol into my routine, I've observed reduced hair breakage and fuller hair enhancing my confidence and mood both in front of the camera and in everyday life. Nutrafol takes a proactive approach to hair health by targeting the root cause of hair thinning. It's as simple as taking four pills daily with a meal, so why not give it a try and experience the difference for yourself? Take the first step to visibly thicker, healthier hair. For a limited time, Nutrafol is offering our viewers $10 off your first month's subscription and free shipping when you go to Nutrafol.com men and enter the promo code Y. Find out why over 4,500 healthcare professionals and hairstylists recommend Nutrafol for healthier hair. Nutrafol.com slash men, N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com slash men and enter promo code Y. Okay, back to the news. How quick were they? Just hours after the launch, workers were reinstalling scaffolding atop the launch deck, boom lifts were up, and the place was swarming with activity. In the coming days, I anticipate inspections around the launch table's legs to identify and repair any potential cracks. Once that is done, the legs will once again receive a coat of new paint. Meanwhile, another team will likely assess the hold down clamps and shielding inside the launch deck, areas where repairs tend to take the most time. Given Stage Zero's iterative design approach, we can expect another series of enhancements aimed at streamlining future repairs even further. Steady progress. Are you starting to see the pattern? It's possible that by the time we reach the fourth flight, the new tank farm could be fully integrated and operational, ready to support Starship. Looking at the previous timeline, SpaceX managed to move from a launch to having a booster on the orbital launch mount for a static fire within a month. And very likely booster 11 is the next in line for a launch. It is possible that it will arrive at the launch site even faster than its predecessor, possibly within the next two weeks. The test campaign for this prototype might consist only of engine firing, as the third flight demonstrated that a single static fire is enough to ensure outstanding booster performance. The Raptor engine design is maturing further and further. Steady progress. I am repeating myself, but it is important to see the big picture. Regarding the upper stage, it's virtually confirmed that Ship 29 will be the next to go into space, as hinted at during the live stream. Having already completed a spin prime test, only a static fire remains on its pre-launch checklist. Ship 28 underwent such a test roughly 4.5 weeks pre-flight, but I believe that Ship 29 will complete such a test even faster. What do you think? Will SpaceX push to achieve a faster launch cadence or will they take some time for significant stage zero upgrades? Share your thoughts in the comments. Now you've watched more than half the video and you are still watching, thank you, this means you like it. We've looked into our channel metrics and there are over 2 million returning monthly viewers who have not subscribed yet. Help us improve the channel even further by double checking that you've hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss our updates. And while you're at it, give us a like and become a Y supporter for exclusive SpaceX updates. With it, you get access to daily Starbase photo galleries, including satellite, aerial and ground photos of SpaceX's progress and countless other extras on top. And no matter how much you decide to give, everyone gets the same supporter content and access. You decide what you want to give. For all those who watched IFT3 with us or somewhere else, I have something very special. So brand new that I don't even have my shirt yet. Our IFT3 commemorative shirt. If you loved IFT3, this is something you want to have. Designed by our very own A Prime and on our shop right now, the shirt is tagged in the video. The link to our Patreon page and our new website is in the description. Thanks to all the supporters who help us fund more crazy projects. We can't thank you enough. You rock. Going back to the news, we begin with the almighty dream chaser. This is worth it. For years, NASA has used the Commercial Resupply Services program to transport supplies to the International Space Station. Did you know that this program is divided into two key phases? The first phase kicked off in 2012, which began with SpaceX's inaugural Dragon flight to the ISS. Yet it wasn't the Dragon 2 capsule that many of us are familiar with today. It was its predecessor, Dragon 1. Fun fact, its last launch was the first launch I ever saw in person. Remarkable. This earlier version was a bit more compact and lacked crew transport capabilities. 
Unlike its predecessor, Dragon 1 required manual berthing to the station, utilizing the Canadarm2 as it wasn't capable of autonomous docking. Alongside SpaceX, the Orbital Sciences Corporation with its Cygnus capsule was the second contractor selected for the initial resupply missions. Then in 2016, NASA began the second phase of the CRS program, opting to include three companies this time around. SpaceX, now with their upgraded Dragon 2 capsule. Orbital, which had since been acquired by Northrop Grumman, continuing with their Cygnus, and Sierra Space, with their Dream Chaser space plane. I love space planes. While SpaceX and Northrop Grumman have been supplying the ISS on a regular basis, Dream Chaser is yet to debut. However, that is about to change, and oh boy, that's going to be something. For several months, Sierra Space has been assembling its first chaser dubbed Tenacity. They even shared a time lapse of the entire assembly process, a fantastic glimpse behind the scenes that I wish more companies would offer. I mean, seriously, if anyone from the space industry is watching this, please give us more videos like this one. In early February, the first Dream Chaser made its way to NASA's Armstrong Flight Research Center in Ohio. There, it was secured onto a massive shake table for vibration testing. This simulated the turbulent conditions of launch to ensure the space plane could survive the liftoff. The initial phase of environmental testing wrapped up on March 7th. By March 15th, the Dream Chaser had been moved to NASA's in-space propulsion facility to begin thermal vacuum testing, marking the last phase before its maiden voyage. After testing is completed, the vehicle will be transported to Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where it will be loaded with cargo in preparation for its inaugural test flight. The Demo-1 mission is scheduled for June 2024 and aims to launch aboard the second Vulcan Centaur rocket produced by ULA. I cannot wait to witness Dream Chaser's launch, though I am even more excited about its re-entry. It is like a mini space shuttle. Did I say that I love space planes? Switching gears back to small satellite companies, last week we discussed the challenges faced by Astra. Now here's a company that doesn't want to end up on a similar path, ABL Space. They are behind the development of the RS-1 rocket, a launcher with capabilities similar to Firefly's Alpha, designed to deliver up to 1350 kilograms or 3000 pounds to low Earth orbit. One of the most interesting aspects of RS-1 is its design philosophy. The entire rocket can be transported in shipping containers. Yes, you heard that right. The first stage, the second stage and even the ground support equipment fit into a few shipping containers. Imagine having a launch capability that only requires a 150 by 50 feet or 45 by 15 meter flat concrete pad with the entire launch facility delivered to your doorstep in containers. Pretty cool, huh? This approach could find use in rapid response launches. I can see a future where a stack of mini launch sites is just waiting in a warehouse ready for action. However, the success of such an ambitious model hinges on the rocket's ability actually to reach space, right? That is important. RS-1's maiden flight in January 2023 was a stark reminder of the challenges that come with launching new rockets. Mere seconds after liftoff, the rocket experienced an abrupt shutdown of all engines, leading to the nearly fully fueled 27 meter or 88 foot tall vehicle crashing back to the launch pad and causing a massive explosion. Space is… okay, I'll stop. After the incident, it was discovered that the root cause of the failure lay in the design of the rocket's launch mount. The design flaw allowed the rocket's plume to re-enter the aft section, sparking an onboard fire that severed power supply cables and shut down the engines. While we are impatient when SpaceX takes two or three months to finish the investigation, we tend to forget that they are usually way faster than the industry standard. ABL, for example, needed 11 months to conclude its investigation for the FAA. While the investigation was going on, the company was preparing for the next RS-1 launch, occasionally dropping updates on their progress. Significant changes have been made to ensure that this time it will actually work. The launch mount has been entirely redesigned, now taller and wider, to mitigate the risk of engine plume recirculation. Nasty word. Additionally, the RS-1 has evolved into the Block 2 variant. It now boasts a 20% increase in thrust and propellant capacity, a detachable first stage aft module and modular engines, all of which aim to improve launch cadence moving forward. 
After a long period of silence on X, ABL recently posted images from their Kodiak Alaska launch site. They indicate that all ground support equipment and the rocket itself have been delivered. Now all they have to do is to conduct a static fire and likely a wet dress rehearsal and RS-1 will be ready to take to the skies once again. Good luck ABL. That's it for today. Remember to smash that like button, subscribe for more awesome content. This is what fuels the algorithm and helps us immensely. Check out our epic shirts in your favorite Space Nerd store. A link is in the description. And if you want to train your space IQ even further, watch this video next to continue your journey. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again in the next episode. Appreciate. Yes, we are appreciative. Oops. <laughs> Center in Ohio, 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 and don't know shop now. Unlike. <laughs>